is a picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss and in case you didn't know, my family and I are what are considered Messianic Jews. Like the early church, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He was Jewish, by the way, and we fully embrace our Jewish heritage. Many people fail to realize the major connections between Judaism and Christianity. Christianity really is a Jewish religion. Both believe in making sacrifices to pay for sin, and Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice when he died on the cross. Whether Jew or Christian, the need for a sacrifice originates in the Old Testament. And one Old Testament sacrifice that is relevant to both Jews and Christians is what happened while the nation of Israel was enslaved in Egypt. You've probably heard of Moses, the 10 plagues, and the famous words, let my people go. It's an interesting course of events, but it really happened. The tenth and final plague of these ten plagues killed the firstborn sons in the land, except for those that had blood from a lamb that was sacrificed painted above the doors. The angel of death, as the Bible says, passed over all of the houses with the lamb's blood painted over the doors. This led to the nation of Israel leaving Egypt and heading towards the promised land. Well, in remembrance of what God did, God instructed the children of Israel, and all of us really, to celebrate the Passover from generation to generation. Even Jesus, who was Jewish, celebrated the Passover. This year, uh, Passover falls in April. It follows the lunar calendar. Sometimes it falls in March. We're going to spend the weeks leading up to Passover breaking down portions of my father's book, A Passover Backstory. This book provides a deep dive into the tradition of Passover and it even highlights how it's relevant to Christians. So stick around. I guarantee you'll learn something and gain a new appreciation for the Passover. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls. We're gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait a separate checks, please. Passover is a festival full of questions. Children ask them, adults ask them, and the answers honor God. You see, Passover reminds all of us of His glory. Did you know that Passover is the most celebrated festival in all the scriptures? More was written about Passover in the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible than any other biblical holiday. I'm the firstborn only son of a very traditional, observant Jewish family. My father came to this country in an exodus from a land that destroyed some of my relatives and most of its Jews. Passover holds special significance to families like ours. Growing up, I was aware of the Ta'anit B'chorim, the fast of the firstborn. This event was remembered annually on the day before Passover, and only firstborn sons were subject to the fast. The rabbis invented this fast for young guys like me. I thought a lot about the 10th plague. I was thankful for life and for freedom far from Egypt. The firstborn sons of my people were spared. Conversely, the firstborn sons of the Egyptians died. We Jews understood the magnitude of our deliverance in comparison to the horror of those doomed in Egypt. Joy and sorrow existed in the parallel universes of obedience and disobedience. Later, the rabbis developed workarounds to their law and kind of more pleasant alternatives came into being to avoid a full 24-hour fast. And We'll consider rabbinic workarounds later. 
for those interested in joining a Seder, an explanation is provided. You may wonder, what is a Seder? The Passover Seder is the most popular ceremony of all Jewish festivals. It serves as an important teaching device to ensure that every generation has a solid understanding of God's love. And simultaneously, we're reminded of our unique deliverance from bondage. A Passover Seder follows a standardized order of service to be certain that each of the important details of the Exodus account are recounted with precision and not forgotten by future generations. God's mighty arm of deliverance carried the Jewish people out of Egyptian slavery. The miracles that brought this deliverance are faithfully recounted every year. Participating in a Seder is a spiritual experience akin to symbolically reliving the first Passover. The service has always been intended to be a teaching tool. As such, the participants hear the story and are expected to join in the recounting of the most glorious event in Jewish history. Now that we know what a Seder is, let me ask and answer another question. What is a Haggadah? The liturgical text from which the Passover service is read is called a Haggadah. The term for this book comes from the Hebrew root word meaning to tell. An ancient true story is retold in every version of the Haggadah. It is the first of the three mandatory elements of each Passover Seder. So, what are the three Passover non-negotiables? The minimum obligations of the Pesach season and a Seder include, number one, to retell the Exodus story. This conforms to the requirement of Exodus chapter 13, verse 3, where it says, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength, of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Number two, to eat matzah, unleavened bread. As stated in Exodus chapter 12, verse 18, in the first month on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. And number three, to abstain from eating chametz, food with leaven. This is commanded in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, where it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Uh, wait, God said Passover was to last seven days. Why does Passover now last for eight days? It's because we do not want to take any chances. So I want to talk a little about fake news, spoofed messages, and firewalls. You see, in temple days, there was no farmer's almanac, no weather channel, and no digital phones with dates and clocks set precisely by satellite for every time zone. The new moon was something someone saw in the sky and reported to headquarters in Jerusalem. Signal fires were lit in different areas on the highest hilltops to pass on the information that the new moon had arrived. And certain festivals were marked based on the new moon. Since we couldn't be sure of the exact time to begin the festival, we added a day to play it safe. That became a very important decision. With millions of Jews living outside of the Holy Land in the Diaspora, we can be confident that the correct seven days are enveloped in the eight days of our modern celebration. But in ancient Israel, another perplexing reason created uncertainty about the timing of the new moon and the duration of Passover. As described in the New Testament, Serious conflict existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, and that conflict continued into the times when the Jerusalem Talmud was compiled near the end of the 4th century and beginning of the 5th century of the Common Era. 
The Samaritans were apparently a sneaky bunch at that time. They sabotaged the Jewish signal fires. They began lighting signal fires on the wrong day to confuse the Jews. And it worked. The Jews who saw the false signal fires had no way of knowing that it was a malicious attempt to deceive those celebrating God's Passover. They simply followed protocol and lit their own fires on the next hilltop to continue sending the news. However, the gullible firelight messengers were unintentionally sending a spoofed message. The rabbis soon realized this was happening and the chaos that it was communicating. And so they stopped using signal fires in the areas where the Samaritans lived. So you see, the Samaritans may have created the first spoofed messages, but the Jews came up with the first firewall. The Babylonian Talmud wisely advised against limiting the celebration to seven days. Today, most Reformed Jews celebrate only seven days, but Passover is uniformly an eight-day celebration by most Jews around the world living outside of Israel. And for that extra day of forced matzah eating, I guess you can just thank the original fake news bureau. So what is the story that uh, we retell? It's fascinating to read different versions of the Haggadah and recognize that all tell the same basic story. Civilizations have come and gone during thousands of years of Jewish history. Yet throughout the many centuries of this celebration, three non-negotiable components of Passover remain standard and consistent. The thrust of a Passover festival is to retell the story of God's deliverance. The plot and script of the Passover drama is recounted with great enthusiasm Otherwise, a cattle prod might be needed to wake the kids. The Exodus account must be understood as a first-person narrative. In other words, we discuss the event in the terms, we were slaves in the land of Egypt. It's imperative that all Jews personally identify with the struggle of slavery and the joy of God's miraculous deliverance. This is made clear after the liturgical segment that follows the fear kashas. Now, who fears a little kasha? The fear kashas is a Yiddish term for the four questions. These famous four scripted questions are typically asked by a child. They're possibly the most well-known Hebrew words in the Seder, which begin with the Hebrew words, ma nishtana. And this reminds me of a story out of England. A British Jew was waiting in line to be knighted by the queen, and he was instructed to kneel in front of her and recite a sentence in Latin when she tapped him on the shoulders with her sword. But at that very moment, he panicked. In the excitement of being knighted, he forgot the perfunctory Latin response. Then, with some fast thinking, he recited the only other words he knew in a foreign language, He recalled them from his turn as a youth, asking the fear kashas at his family's Passover Seder. So without missing another beat, he declared, Manishtana halayla hazeh mikal halaylot. And puzzled, Her Majesty turned to her advisor and whispered, Forgive me, I can't help myself. Why is this night different from all other nights? I'm here all eight days, folks. If you're not Jewish, I assume that was why you didn't laugh uproariously. Because let me tell you, that was funny. If you are Jewish, can you show a brother a courtesy guffaw to make the Gentiles think I'm funny? Seriously now, I do have indelible personal remembrances of my first recitation of the fair kashas. My parents and grandparents were circumspect in ensuring that my generation of family members understood the relevance of Passover. Each of the young male children in our mishpacha, our family, were required to take our turns at chanting the four questions. 
in the year that my turn came, I approached that fateful Seder with fear and trepidation because at that moment I was about eight years old feeling 80. I know that everyone would be carefully checking for flaws in my performance, and they were. Years later, I figured out that Judaism is not a spectator sport, and the Passover Seder is organized to bring everyone in as a participant. And for this reason, after the four questions are asked, a partial answer is recited by the group. And the focus of our response is to recall and declare that we were slaves in Egypt. Avadim chayinu. We were slaves. I want to consider those words from the old Haggadah I used while growing up. The Aramaic quote of this Avadim Chayinu is found in a great response after the four questions. Because we were slaves unto Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Eternal our God brought us forth thence with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And if the Most Holy Blessed Be He had not brought forth our ancestors from Egypt, we and our children and our children's children would still be in bondage to the pharaohs in Egypt. Every Jewish participant is reminded that if God had not redeemed and delivered us from Mitzrayim, Egypt, we would still be slaves in the land of Pharaoh. This also instills in us the understanding that God is in charge and in a personal relationship with His people. He was, He is, and He will be our Redeemer. This covenantal relationship lies at the heart of the celebration of Passover. We rejoice for the past liberation from Egypt and for other redemptions by God since then. And because of the fulfillment of past promises, we anticipate at Passover the future final redemption. So I got to ask, when you sit at a Passover table and you see the matzah, you must wonder, is that a Texas cracker? The, se the second mandatory element is unleavened bread. Matzah. This is a requirement that probably everyone recognizes. As we know, it is symbolic of the unleavened bread Moses told the children of Israel to eat on their hasty escape from Egypt. Both unleavened bread and leaven will be meaningful topics of this festival. Whether you realize it or not, products that contain any leaven are prohibited to be inside any Jewish homes during the eight days of Passover. These Forbidden products are called chametz, leaven. But, you know, you'll wonder, would a few Twinkies really hurt anyone? The third non-negotiable is that normal breads and baked goods are prohibited. In fact, the Jewish tradition requires a careful cleaning process to ensure that every Jewish home is pesadik, kosher for Passover. Observant Jews try to remove every trace of leaven from their dwelling. No Twinkies, literally. Not even a cookie crumb is to remain under the couch cushion. God wants our homes to be pure. He said, there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off. Sounds serious, doesn't it? Merely eating a bit of leaven or having a speck of pancake batter left on the stovetop was grounds for excommunication. God said they would be cut off from the children of Israel. Is this matter relevant to Christians? Is the topic of chametz discussed in the New Testament? Yes. Both Judaism and Christianity symbolically relate chametz, leaven, to sin. The Jewish Apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, specifically called immorality leaven. He said that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul was concerned that sin would proliferate in the lives of new Christians. He warned believers in the church of Corinth to purge out 
the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Jews of the New Testament church, the primary members of the New Testament church, well understood the relationship between Christ and Passover and between leaven and sin. Observant Jews have always recognized that the blood of the Passover lamb saved the children of Israel in Egypt. When Christians understand the heart of Passover, the writings of Paul make more sense. Paul described Jesus as the Passover lamb. Therein Paul proposed that the blood of Jesus secured our freedom from another form of slavery, slavery to sin. But what about leaven? All who believe in the writings of Rav Shaul, of the Apostle Paul, must understand why we must remove sin or leaven from our lives. Before we reach the conclusion of our Passover Seder, a final question will be posed that only you can answer. Is there leaven in your life? If we're honest, we all have leaven in our lives. The question is, what do we do with it? One of the Jewish writers of the New Testament wrote of our leavened status as follows. He said, there is none righteous. No, not one. King Solomon said it even clearer. Solomon wrote, there is not a righteous man upon the earth that does good and sins not. Even Solomon wasn't completely original. He probably learned this from his father, David HaMelech, King David. In the 14th Psalm, David said essentially the exact same thing. If one believes the Bible, we must admit that we all have leaven in our lives. Now, we may think we can hide it, but that is an illusion. We cannot. I think God wants it purged from our soul and the residue removed from our actions. He does not want it hidden. He wants it removed. Christians and Jews can facilitate this process by respecting each other and sharing the common ground of Pesach. That is the reason Passover is the perfect Jewish connection to the Last Supper. Passover is a bridge connecting Jews and Christians. Remember, a bridge allows traffic to travel in two directions. Let's try to make the philosophical trip toward each other so we can love and understand our differences with more grace and wisdom. Perhaps it will allow us to celebrate our divine connections with more joy. Wow, I know that that was a lot of information to take in, but I hope you enjoyed it. There's a whole lot more in the book and a whole lot more that my dad's gonna be talking through and I hope that you're uh, really getting something out of it. I wanna take just a moment and talk about the leaven that my dad was talking about. You see, leaven is something that might not always be understood what's being referenced. I know that when I grew up going to my home Passover with the family every year, we were reminded about leaven in our lives. And of course, when you're young, when you're a child, you don't necessarily fully comprehend what that means because as a child, I didn't even know what leaven was from a baking context. And so trying to understand it from a spiritual context, of course, was a little bit more difficult. But as I got older and the concept was repeated year after year as we celebrated the Passover like we were instructed to in the Bible, uh, it became more real. You see, Leaven is talking about sin, and it only takes a little bit. Just like with baking, it only takes the tiniest bit of leaven to make that bread rise. It only takes the tiniest bit of sin to make us insufficient, unclean, impure. And there's no room for impurity in the kingdom of heaven. You see, sin is like a cancer. It will kill the entire body, even the tiniest bit even the tiniest bit of leaven 
will create a problem for the entirety of who we are and what we do. Which is why it's so important that we lean on God, who was the once and all sacrifice. We have to keep going back to the Lord and keep requesting His forgiveness, keep requesting His repentance in our lives, that we can turn from our ways, change our ways, run, flee from the sin in our lives. That's why when we follow the Lord's prayer, it says, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We want to flee temptation. We want to flee anything that resembles sin, anything that could cause us to stumble. I want you to think about your own life. Maybe reflect on your own life. And we're not just talking about the big sins, you know. I, I know that the people that are watching this program, you probably aren't murderers. Uh, you probably haven't gone and robbed any banks or uh, created any sort of uh, big major sins that cause problems with a bunch of people. But maybe, maybe you're struggling with unforgiveness. Maybe you're struggling with uh, unrepentance, with pride or slander. Maybe you talk about people too much. Maybe you just aren't walking in faith that God's called you. Maybe you haven't followed in obedience with something God's called you to walk in. You see, leaven in our lives can look like many different things, and maybe it's not always what we expect, which is why we want to go to God often like, like David did and say, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Lord, search me, know me, know my heart, and help reveal to me what in my life may be leaven that I need to repent for because I recognize that even the slightest bit of leaven can leaven the whole lump. I want to encourage you to reach out to us online. You can find us on the website, crosstalk.org. You can also find more about the book at my dad's website, randyweiss.com. And while you're there, you can get a free PDF download of the book. This is something that we want to make available to you so that you can not only continue to go through the concept yourself, but perhaps you can go through and, and do a Passover Seder with your own family and teach your loved ones about the concepts of leaven and the concepts of Passover and what Jesus as the Passover lamb really means. I want to invite you to reach out to us on social media. You can find us by searching the handle at Crosstalk TV. And anytime you've got a prayer request, feel free. You can give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. You can also reach out to us through the social media handles or on the website and let us know if there's something we can be lifting up and praying with you about. As always, I encourage you, if the Lord lays it on your heart, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization and your contributions are very appreciated. It helps us to continue the ministry work that we're doing and so any gift is appreciated and of course tax deductible and I want to encourage you come back next time for more of this valuable content so that we can continue learning from what God taught us throughout the Old Testament and the Passover Seder. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.